Bill, thank you very much. We now have Mark Agras, the chair of the Rule of Law Index Project, to give more of an overview of the Rule of Law Index. We also will have on this panel uh, Juan Batero, the director of the index, and Alejandra Ponce, uh, one of our scholars on the Rule of Law Index, who will be participating in a fuller discussion. Thank you very much and good morning everybody, good afternoon. Um, the Rule of Law Index team, of which I'm proud to be a part, has spent the past four years developing, testing, and refining the index that you have before you. What began as a pilot in six countries now measures, as uh, Bill was saying, major population centers in 66 countries throughout the world, with over 30 more to come in 2012. Uh, my role today is to provide just a brief outline of the architecture of this index and some of the key questions that we've grappled with in putting it together. Rule of Law Index is an innovative quantitative assessment tool developed by the World Justice Project to provide a detailed and comprehensive picture of the extent to which countries do or do not adhere to the rule of law across multiple dimensions. It's designed to offer a robust, reliable, and independent source of data for governments, policymakers, businesses, and civil society. The goals of the index are principally three. First, to assess a nation's adherence to the rule of law, not in theory, not, not as the books are written, but in practice, as perceived and experienced by the average person. Second, to identify a nation's strengths and weaknesses in comparison to similarly situated countries, that is to say, to compare it to its peers. And third, to encourage countries to undertake practical improvements that strengthen their adherence to the rule of law. This particular index has a number of features that we think make it distinctive. First, it is comprehensive. Other indices cover aspects of the rule of law this index provides a full picture of rule of law compliance in each country. Second, the findings are based on almost entirely new data collected by the World Justice Project from independent sources around the world. This contrasts it with other indices that rely to a great extent on data aggregated from third party sources or sources that are self-reported by governments or other interested parties. Third, the index measures adherence to the role of law by looking not to the laws as they are written, but at how they are actually applied in practice. Fourth, the index measures the rule of law as it is actually experienced by combining expert opinion with rigorous polling of the general public. The index methodology ensures that the findings reflect the conditions experienced by the population, including marginalized sectors of society. And fifth, the index is action-oriented. Findings are presented in disaggregated form, identifying strong and weak performers across each of the rule of law dimensions that we examine in each country. The index is based on the four principles that were described by our founder, which make up our working definition of the rule of law. To ensure the cultural universality of these principles, We've derived them insofar as possible from established international standards and vetted them through extensive international consultations. The four principles encompass four indispensable attributes or elements or dimensions of the rule of law. And those are the four that you see. Accountable government, security and fundamental rights, open government and regulatory enforcement, and access to justice. These four elements provide a basic structure for the index, and they're broken down into nine building blocks, which we call factors. The factors, in turn, are further disaggregated into 52 sub-factors, 
which are listed on the diagram of the index that's reproduced on page 11 of the index volume. That is, in fact, the index as it stands. The first element, accountable government, consists of factors one and two. Factor one measures the extent to which those who govern are themselves subject to the law. It covers the means by which the powers of the government and its officials and agents are limited and by which they're held accountable under the law. It also includes a number of non-governmental checks and balances on the government's power, such as free and independent press and other civil society institutions. Factor two measures the extent to which the society is able to limit corruption, including bribery, improper influence by public or private interests, and misappropriation of public funds or other resources, all of which have a corrosive effect on public confidence in the rule of law. The second element, security and fundamental rights, consists of factors three and four. Factor three measures how well the society assures the security of persons and property. It encompasses three dimensions, crime, civil conflict, and the use of violence to redress private grievances. Factor four measures the success of the society in promoting fundamental rights. Now, given the lack of consensus as to which rights are fundamental, the index focuses on a relatively limited menu of rights that are firmly established under international law and most closely related to rule of law concerns, such as equal protection, freedom of thought and expression, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly and association, fundamental labor rights, the, due, the rights of due process, the right of privacy uh, and, uh, and religion, the right to life and security of the person, and so forth. The third element, Open government and regulatory enforcement consists of factors five and six. Factor five measures open government, which includes at its core the opportunity to know what the law is and what kinds of conduct are permitted and prohibited. This is one of the fundamental preconditions for achieving and maintaining a rule of law society. Factor six concerns the fair and effective implementation and enforcement of administrative rules. This includes administrative procedures that are fair, consistent, and predictable. The fourth element, access to justice, consists of the last three factors, seven, eight, and nine. Factor seven measures whether ordinary people have access to a civil justice system that enables them to peacefully and effectively resolve their disputes without resort to violence or self-help. This requires that the system be affordable, effective, impartial, and culturally competent. Factor eight measures whether the criminal justice system is capable of investigating and adjudicating criminal offenses impartially and effectively while ensuring that the rights of suspects and victims are protected. Finally, factor nine concerns the role played in many countries by what are often called informal systems of law in resolving disputes. This includes traditional tribal religious courts as well as community-based dispute resolution systems. These systems often play a very large role in cultures in which formal legal institutions fail to provide effective legal redress for large segments of the population. Now, uh, over the last several years, we've devoted a lot of time and attention to collecting data on informal justice systems, to learning as much as we can about them. However, uh, the assessment of these systems has proven to be especially complex, and we're not yet at a stage at which we're prepared to present results for factor nine. So as you will see, we, we measure everything up to that point. We are hopeful that by next year, we'll begin to put out information related to factor nine as well. Uh, finally, I should note that the index has been designed and extensively tested to ensure that it is culturally competent, by which we mean that it takes into account diverse patterns of governance, differing political, economic, and legal systems, and differing social and cultural norms. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to our next speaker, Alejandro Ponce, who will describe the methodology we use to measure the rule of law. Thank you.
Thank you, Mark. Um, so far, what Mark explained was basically what is exactly what we're measuring. So what I'm going to talk about is how do we measure what we are supposed to be measuring. The first thing is, uh, rather than measuring, so we want to, let, let, let's, let's walk through an example. So let's assume that you can just take the, the index volume and in page 11 you have all the factors and sub-factors that we're trying to measure. So these are the concepts that we want to measure. So for instance, if you take factor 2.1, we want to measure government officials in the executive branch do not use public office for private gain. So the question is how can we generate indicators on these that are comparable across countries and that can give us actual information of this concept of corruption in the executive? Our approach is rather than going and checking all the laws in the different countries, all countries have laws about corruption. So rather than going and checking all the laws and where those laws are implemented and the difference between the laws and so on, what we do is first is we're, going, we're not going to look at the laws, we're going to look at the facto or the, the, the facto measures. We're going to look from a perspective of the ordinary people, if you want. The next one is that we're going to use two new sources of data. And here, let me just first, there are two questions underlined there, two and new. First, why new? We know that there are other sources available that can actually look at situations in different countries that may be comparable between countries um, that look at corruption. So why are we gathering new data? So the first one is because we have, as we mentioned, just 52 sub-factors. There is, even though there is data in some sub-factors, there is not data in all available sub-factors and for all available countries. So if we actually want to do this exercise well done and cover the, uh, just as many countries as possible, we actually have to gather data. The second one is why are we gathering two data sources? And there are two reasons for that. The first one is because different people have different views about situations. So we want to, to, to understand the phenomenon and understand possible biases of different, of different uh, respondents. The second one is because different people know about very different situations. If we go and ask the general public, for instance, about just the, how is the security in your neighborhood, probably the people will be able to tell uh, to tell us how the security is, whether if we ask, have you been actually victim of a burglary, probably the people know. So, but if we go and ask them about how is the situation in the prisons in the city, probably they don't know. So then we'll go and have another source of people who are actually dealing on, with that situation on a daily basis to answer those kind of questions. So it's a complement, uh, it's on one side to complement and on the other side to have different perspectives. So what we have is we gather new data um, we have two new sources, so the first one is a general population poll, so we go to each one of the countries that we are covering in the index, uh, hire local companies, and the local companies uh, just administer a questionnaire that we design to actually map into the different sub-factors and factors that we have in page 11, and implement a survey in the three largest cities. Of they interview basically 1,000 random people, just as a probability sample, and about all these issues that matter, that are relevant for the rule of law. The second one is we know that people do not know about all the stuff. So then we go and ask to local experts that deal with these situations on a daily basis about different situations. So we have experts from four, four different disciplines. Um, just we have experts on civil and commercial law. We have experts on criminal law. We have experts on labor law. We have experts on public health. So this can give us a large amount of data on these different sub-factors and factors and concepts that we want to measure uh, to, to give us some sort of indication of how countries are doing in each one of these concepts. After all this exercise, so what we have is 2,000 experts have answered these, uh, these questionnaires, 63,000 people, just we have around 400 questions uh, of, of all this massive data set. Just to give you an example of some of the questions that we ask, for instance, if we ask the people, we have experience-based questions, so that means that we ask about, have you experienced a burglary in the last three years? Have you been beaten by the police in the last three years? We also ha ask questions about perceptions. We ask questions about, in which we customize the scenarios. If, if, if you think about it, just how can we just come up with a scenario that it's applicable in the US and in Liberia? So it, it's a challenge, right? So then we, we need to come up, okay, so what about a, a, a dispute between neighbors? 
and what are the, the procedures. So, so we customize the dispute between neighbors and then just go and start from there how it's resolved in each one of the countries, just, just based on, 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 the, on the responses from the experts. So as I was saying, so we have just enormous amount of data, and then what we have to do is obviously just map it into the factors and subfactors that are in page 11. So we put together a lot of these questions um, and just generate the scores, normalize them between zero and one and so on. So just to give you an example, the example that we were talking about before on corruption, so if we want to measure corruption in the executive, what we do is we're probably going to have questions on bribery, just experience-based questions on bribery that we ask to the general public. We're going to have also perception questions on bribery as well. Probably we're going to have questions also uh, to the experts on the different areas that we have, just that, that are related somehow to, to corruption in the executive. Probably we're going to have as well simple scenarios uh, so that we can just come up together, just all these questions, for instance, the one that I just mentioned, just corruption in the executive, we have about 50 questions that somehow map different dimensions of this concept because this concept is super broad. The executive is, has many different agencies, so we'll have to somehow deal with, with all this uh, 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 variety in concepts. Let me just give you one example of actually how the data look at. So if you can just, just open your, your index report and just pick the country that, that, you, that you want. I'm just going to use India as an example. So what the country profile says, that's, a camp, uh, that's example, an example of the country profile. So it basically summarizes the concepts that we have in page 11. In the first part, we have a table which actually has the factors just these are aggregated concepts, the nine factors that Mark just mentioned. In the second part, what we have are just these factors disaggregated into each one of the components, so the, 50, the 52 sub-factors. This is, for instance, one, one example of one of the sub-factors. This one is for India, security and fundamental rights. So the way to, to, to read these charts is just these are radius between zero and one, so zero is the lowest score. One is the highest score, so we actually had to codify each one of the questions so that it's ranged between zero and one, where one is more rule of law. And then, so each one of the points just measure one of the sub-factors or dimensions that we have. So for instance, in this case, we have in 3.2, for instance, that's a problem for India. India is, is in, in dark blue. And for comparison, we also put just middle-income countries, which India perhaps can compare with, and countries in the southeastern region. So we have, for instance, 3.2, your civil conflict is effectively limited, so there is a problem there for India. It's scoring very low. We have another one, for instance, freedom of as as assembly and association, in which India perhaps is scoring a little bit higher. Just for all the countries, we have a country profile. But the thing is that we have also this enormous amount of data that we just using this for generating these scores is, is one way to use it, but it's not the only way to use it. So something, for instance, that, that you have here is something that, that we have in the, in the report. And this is, for instance, a very interesting table or, or, or graph in which we ask the public in 66 countries whether they have, had physic whether they have been physically abused by the police in the last three years. And since we ask demographics, we actually can compare, and what, this is what this graph does, is comparing the responses between poor people and rich people. So not surprisingly, what we find is that poor people is obviously much more likely to get beaten by the police than rich people. But I mean, this, is, this is not groundbreaking. We basically just, we, we know that. But the thing is that this is actually able to provide some evidence on this, just hard data on this. So if we actually want to make an argument, we can take this graph and show it. So just very briefly, what the index is not. So the index is first an assessment tool. So but similar as when you go to the doctor and you, you feel ill, right? You just go and check and go to the doctor and the doctor probably is just going to check the temperature and, and, and so on. The index is just those, whenever the first time that you go to the doctor and you check your temperature. It's just a very broad assessment, but just by checking your temperature, you don't really know what disease you have. For that, probably the doctor will have to make an assessment, just send some lab, send, send, make some lab tests and so on, just with all the knowledge that the doctor has, probably just come up with a diagnosis, and they just based on that, just come up with a prescription. So the index is just this first step, it's just this temperature, right? But it's useful. It's useful because it's an indicator to know whether things are, are, are right or wrong. 
it's a tool. So probably some of you are familiar with this guy. Probably some of you just see them often, particularly you of the, those of you who have kids. Um, so this is handy Manny. Manny has many tools. So the index is just one tool. So it doesn't substitute contra assessments, qualitative research, or impact evaluation. Those are other tools. So the index is only one. So with that, I'm, I'm just going to leave to, to Juan, who's going to speak a little bit about the, the impact of the index. Um, thank you, Alex. And thank you all for being here. Um, Mark spoke what we measure. Alex said how we measure. I'm going to tell you something about how it has been used and why it matters. The first, to finalize this, this to open this, this, this final part, it is a work in progress. We, have, we piloted six countries, then we moved to 35, then we moved to final report, then we moved to 66. Now we're moving to 100. This is a growing progress. No, I am going in the wrong way. No. OK. This is the um, slide for accountable government in Russia. And we see here that um, the effective system of checks and balances between the branches of power uh, appear to be grossly underperforming income and regional peers. What happened next is that the president of Russia gave a speech showing how Russia is a very high rule of law country. And in some dimensions it is, but certainly not in the effective system of checks and balances. And the Washington Post picked that up and many others and in the Russian blogs and in the Russian community, it has been uh, providing evidence like an external, independent data source to put things in perspective. This is the case of Colombia. We see that Colombia in the effectiveness of the criminal investigation system and in the uh, timely adjudication of civil disputes is seriously underperforming even income and regional peers. The president of Colombia took the challenge in several of his policy speeches have presented this as evidence for the need of judicial reform. The Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Planning, the judiciary have engaged with us and have asked us to go deeper into the existing efforts. This complements efforts by other entities such as the World Bank and we see Christina here um, that are working in the field in Colombia. This provides uh, another tool for motivating and advancing the reform effort. This is the Vice President of the Philippines speaking about the need to um, be more effective in the campaign against piracy and counterfeiting and in general to expand protection of property, intellectual property rights in the country, citing the findings of the rule of law index as one of the elements in which provides objective external information in context as compared to enablers on the need to make those reforms. In the United States, this is the economy, the New York Times, the Miami Herald, and other, all other, many other uh, media outlets focusing on the problem of access to civil justice for marginalized communities. This is Canada, this is the Chief Justice of Canada, making the argument, again, of access to civil justice for marginalized communities. The Chief Justice of Canada also invited us, we, we're going to go in a couple of months for a meeting with all the Chief Justices of all the provinces of Canada to analyze this data in greater level of detail. The index, if you, if you will, this is the top of the iceberg of a massive data set. And putting this data in context with the neighbors, and in this case, comparing the US and Canada, who have shared the same problem with Western European countries, who appear grossly, enormously outperform the Americans in this particular dimension, provides a context that is a powerful incentive for reform. This is Singapore. We've been talking and meeting with the Singaporean government, the Minister of Chief Justice, uh, for over two years. Not only on the things that they do very well, and nobody can deny that in the rule of law in Singapore is very effectively protected in many dimensions, but also if you look at the third paragraph, 
the problem of uh, freedom of speech in Singapore. And that's one in which we have been working uh, to try to provide the tools for the governments that want to reform. And when that doesn't happen, for other elements of society, multinational companies, to use it as an objective and external reference point for local communities, for NGOs. This is the same case of Mexico. This is the Chief Justice of Mexico commenting with the President of the National University, commenting the findings of the index, specifically on the effectiveness of the police and of the criminal investigation system based on these findings. This, and we could go on with many other examples. Just a pause, of, uh, a pause to, to, to make a word of caution. This is not the complete diagnosis. It is not a treatment mechanism. It doesn't give you priorities for reform. It doesn't tell you what the reasons for the fever are or what you can do about them. It only tells you the patient has fever. However, when fever is such fundamental things of lack of accountable government, that fever is pretty bad. It's pretty damaging for a country. And this tool helps to put that fever in context in all these dimensions of the rule of law. We're moving into what next steps. We're moving into more countries, 100 this year, topic specific and country specific. We're also moving into partnering with other organizations, the ABA uh, section of the environment on the environmental compliance report, the Hague Institute for Internationalization of the Law in an effort in Tunisia specifically, the one of the many parts of the World Bank on a gender specific uh, initiative, and so on and so forth. There are we are, now that this project is to a certain level, we, we want to continue expanding this, um, the reach of this product. We are also making available the data set. And today, it is the, all the sub-factors for the first time has been released. And academics from all over the world that have requested this data can now download it and use it for papers. They, they have already begun appearing. And uh, we expect this to be widely used. Uh, our peers, the OECD, the um, Transparency International and others are also using this data. We want to make it available for others to use. Um, uh, big thanks to the extraordinary team, the board of directors, the officers and the staff, and to the 2,000 experts all over the world and the 66,000 people around the world who has contributed to this exercise. And with that, I will finish and thank you very much for your attention.